Welcome back everyone to Nia Ita Book Reviews. Today I am going to be discussing Ijeoma Aluo's So You Want to Talk About Race. Now Ijeoma is an American writer. She was born in Texas, now Seattle based, has been there for a long time. You know, she started out in technology and marketing and then she kind of s switched gears and really got into this writing life in 2012 after Trayvon Martin was murdered. And she said she was just filled with this, this fear, this fear for her brother, for her sons and their safety. And so she started a blog and she writes uh, a little bit about her personal journeys in this, but it's more so a manual and a guide on how to have difficult conversations about race in America. She outlines every chapter as a question. And then from there, she answers the question as best as she can and she tries to end the chapters out with bullet points. Really simple, short, to the point. One of the first chapters is called, What is Racism? You need to have a working definition of anything before you can try and have conversations about it, be adept at it, acknowledge it and identify it. You need to know what it means. And a lot of people confuse prejudice and racism. So she defines, and I've always agreed with this, racism as prejudice against someone because of their race. But it's a prejudice that is reinforced by systems of power. This is important. I'm sure if someone has ever called you a cracker, it may have hurt your feelings. I'm, I'm not denying that. But the question is, is that enforced by systems of power? Does it affect your ability to walk safely through the street? You know, be able to apply for jobs or get into schools? Likely the answer is no. So she starts there and I think she sets a really strong foundation for the rest of the book. The next chapter that I really liked is what if I talk about race wrong? Some people are scared to talk about race whether it be people of color or white people because they don't know how and they're scared they're gonna mess it up. And I think the first thing, regardless of what race you are, you need to embrace is that you are going to do it wrong. You're going to fail. Just like everything else in life, you're gonna mess up before you become more adept at it. She'll give some bullet points on what you can do to fail less often, <laughs> to fail a little less hard. Things like, if you feel defensive, check yourself and ask why, which I think is a great conflict resolution tip, period. When you start to feel emotion heightening in a conversation, you start to feel yourself getting defensive because you, you can feel it when it's happening. I know I can. Ask yourself why. Why am I feeling defensive in this situation? Do not tone police. Do not tell people they should be saying something in a, in a different way that they're saying it. Like, why do you have to say it that way? Because they're emotionally charged. It's an emotionally charged subject. And be mindful, especially if you're white, of things like I and me. So if I'm having a conversation with you about police brutality or the school to prison pipeline, and you say, well, I know someone who's a principal and my friend is a police officer and he treats everyone the same. Yet, single incidents like that are not the general rule of thumb. So don't do that. Don't try and combat a conversation about a nation with I and me. Check yourself when you start using those words. There might be something there. Ask yourself, am I trying to do better, be better, or am I trying to be right? If you're trying to be right, don't bother having a conversation. It's, it's not going to end well. She also talks a lot about why it's important to check your privilege. And we all have privilege, right? I'm not saying that because I'm a woman of color, that I don't have privilege. I have privilege. I walk into certain rooms and I'm looked at differently because I have a master's degree from an Ivy League school, because I'm able-bodied, because I didn't have any learning disabilities growing up. I didn't have any dyslexia or dyscalculia, so the schools in that sense were set up a little bit more in my favor. I didn't struggle in that way. And there are people that do. So it's really important to check your privilege and do not, if we're having a conversation about race, do not then try and fight off that conversation because I grew up poor or I grew up and then insert whatever, you know, underprivileged areas you may have experienced. Because we're having a conversation about 
race. That's like talking, that's like, that's like speaking a different language. You're addressing two completely different forms of privilege. So if we're talking about race, we're talking about race. You can't try and say, well, I know how you feel because I grew up poor. Yes, if we're having a conversation about class, that's different. But we're talking about being a person of color and you have not been a person of color. So just try not to do that. I really enjoyed the chapter on what is the school to prison pipeline. If you don't know what that is, Google school to prison pipeline. There have been numerous studies, lots of articles. Long story short, it's, it's how systems are being set up so that our brown kids, our brown students are being almost tunneled into these prisons. And it's atrocious, it's heartbreaking, and it's a reality. If you work in education, if you are a community leader, you need to be aware that this is happening and this is a great chapter. It might even help you build some workshops around that to raise awareness in your community and in your schools about what the teachers can do differently, what the administrators can do differently, what our community leaders can do differently with their funding. She talks about how her brother had a teacher who has a reward system of some sort, would give out fake money in the class every time that people did things right. She was trying to set up accountability, responsibility, I'm not really sure what she was trying to teach. At the end of the week, the kids had to pay rent on their desks and then with any extra money that they had, they could buy you know, toys, sweets, whatever it might be. Every Friday, her brother would end up sitting on the floor with no desk because he couldn't manage to pay rent on his desk. He, his behaviors or whatever was going on in the classroom didn't allow him, and he was also negatively reinforced in that even if he did earn money for one thing, it'd get taken away from him for another thing. So the kids started taunting him and calling him homeless. In the hallways, she would hear the kids calling him homeless, and she eventually figured out why. And this is this is real, right? It, it's happened, other forms of this happen, and it is detrimental to our kids. So I very much enjoyed that chapter. She had another one on why can't I touch your hair. It was amusing, but also very real. It just kind of broke it down, like do not touch anyone's body without their permission, it's not okay. Plus your hands are dirty and curls are precious, which is true if you know this and have curly hair. Once someone touches your curl, the curl pattern gets kind of messed up. She had a chapter on microaggressions, both for the people who are on the receiving end of microaggressions and on the delivering end. This is the part that I want to photocopy and carry around in my wallet because it's a step-by-step -step on how to address microaggressions. It can be hard. It's like you're walking down the street and someone punches you in the arm. Okay, kind of hurts. You keep walking down the street and you keep getting punched in the same spot over and over again, unexpectedly. You don't know where it's coming from or who's gonna do it. Some people walk by and do nothing. Other people walk by and punch you in the same spot. The spot on your arm starts to get really sore. Finally, someone walks by and they're just talking, right? And sometimes you're like moving your arms and they're talking and they accidentally hit you on that same spot on your arm. And you lose it. And that's kind of what microaggressions are like. We spend our lives hearing all these things, these assumptions about how we should look or how we should speak based off of stereotypes that people have been socialized with. And then one day someone says something, be it intentionally or not intentionally, and it just, it rubs that same spot and we can't take it anymore. She says, the first thing you do is respond by stating what actually happened. So you just say it back. You know, you just assume that I don't speak English. Or, and I wrote an article about this once, you just told me that it's not worth learning how to pronounce my name. I've, I've, this happens all the time, people are like, oh, whatever it is. The next thing you do is you ask some uncomfortable questions. Is this something you would have said to a white person? Then you reinforce that good intentions don't really matter. I hear that you didn't mean to hurt my feelings, but you did. And it's not cool that you say stuff like this. And the last that you remember that you're not crazy and you have every right to address this type of thing. On the delivering end, if, if you've accidentally said something, or not accidentally, you actually believe something to be true that is very problematic and you need to do some self-reflection, apologize, say you're sorry, 
and then research further on your own time. It is not the other person's responsibility to educate you on why what you said is not okay. Go home and do a Google search. Google is your friend. It is a verb in the dictionary now. She talks about the model minority myth and I won't get into it, but it's very problematic and it leaves out a lot of communities. Like there's a lot of assumptions that the, you know, Asians and Asian Americans are seen as model minorities, but often they're just looking at people from like China or Japan and they're completely ignoring Filipinos and Pacific Islanders. And there is an unprecedented economic gap with, with these communities as well sometimes an educational gap and disparity. So that's, that's a problematic myth as well that's harming a lot of people that are considered Asian Americans. That's a great chapter and I'm glad that she included that because it's important when we talk about race and they often kind of get sidelined. The last two chapters were my favorite. The second to last was called, I just got called a racist, what do I do now? She gives tips to people who have been accused of being racist. And she says things like, listen, listen to the impact that you're having on someone. Set your intentions aside. I know you didn't mean that, but listen to what you did with those words or with those actions. Know that nobody owes you a debate. Nobody owes you a relationship. And remember that you're not the only one that got hurt. She delves into these a lot more in her book. The last chapter was called Talking is Great, but what else can I do? And I think that she sums this up perfectly and it's what she does throughout the entire book. She gives you all these gems on how to have difficult conversations about race, regardless of what race you are. And then she leaves you with, yeah, talking is, is good. It's important, it's necessary, but action is also necessary. And here are the next steps, the practical, strategies that you can use in your life to fight racism. If you are a white person, if you are a brown person, if you are just a person that is not a member of the Ku Klux Klan, <laughs> um, this is definitely a book that is worth checking out. It's an easy read, it is valuable, and it really makes an impact and hopefully not just in your life but in the life of everyone around you. Check it out. If you did read it, leave a comment in the section below. Let me know what you thought and thank you for watching.